Numa Pompilius was known as the second king of Rome after having taken over after the death of the legendary founder, Romulus, a man who was said to have either gone missing in a storm or was murdered by the Roman nobility. Legends say that Romulus actually ascended to the heavens and became a god, but in each instance his disappearance left the throne vacant and for an entire year members of the senate exercised the royal power in a weekly rotation. According to the Greek biographer and essayist Plutarch, Numa Pompilius was born on April 21st, 753 BC, the exact day that Romulus himself had founded Rome. We know little about Numa's early life, but some sources indicate that he lived a life of severe discipline and was not one to indulge in luxuries. Stories tell of how Numa married a daughter of the Sabine king, Titus Tatius, but that after 13 years of marriage, she died, causing Numa to retire to the countryside where he became a recluse. Stories tell of how Numa was descended upon by a nymph, or some mystical creature, that stole him away as her lover in the wake of his wife's death. Regardless, it wasn't the only Sabine death to have taken place. The Sabine king Titus Tatius also met with an untimely end when he was killed in a riot. This led the then king Romulus, who he was ruling alongside of, to obtain full control. So while there was something of a contingency plan in place to succeed the death of one of the kings, there was no plan in place to succeed Romulus when he died or was taken by the heavens as the legends say. This led both Rome and Sabine to become kingless and it was the senate that would have to scramble to find a new leader. It would take a full year in which the senate would operate on a rotation as they carried out the royal duties and governed the people until a worthy king could be appointed. Eventually, through a string of tricky political strategies, on behalf of the Senate, a compromise was reached and Numa Pompilius of the Sabines was elected. But given his withdrawal to the countryside, Pompilius did not want to take the throne. He rejected the notion of ruling over Rome and Sabine, and it would take the combined efforts of the Senate, his mentor, his father and his peers to persuade him into accepting. Going by the accounts of Plutarch, Pompilius was offered all the power and riches he could ask for if he accepted their offer, as well as enthusiastic reception from the Romans who weren't necessarily keen on having a Sabine ruler at all. Before accepting kingship though, Pompilius wanted more than just the materialistic offerings of the senate and even more than just the acceptance of the Roman people. No, Pompilius wanted a step further and wanted the approval of the gods. And so Jupiter was consulted and what was said to be a string of favourable omens took place in his life around him. Others say that Numa watched the skies for a sign and that a flight of birds was enough for him to determine that he was indeed meant to be king. By this, Pompilius took up his position as the second king of Rome. Plutarch states that one of Numa's first acts as king was to disband the Solaris, a personal guard of Romulus which consisted of 300 highly skilled fighters by doing so, he showed the Romans and the Sabines that he sought not for power, expansion or either military dominance, but instead simply peace. The disbandment of the Solaris was also a sign of a new age, an age where such a host of bodyguards would not be necessary. As if to exemplify this age of harmony across his people, Numa would also erect the Temple of Janus, a temple built in honour of the god of boundaries, Janus but also so as to distract the early war-hungry Romans who may still have craved the battles that Romulus amply supplied them with. The temple was thought to instill awe and reverence upon these men and inspire them to be better men, spiritual men, and not the violent ones that they had once been. Numa was also responsible for the creation of the cult of the god Terminus, the protector of boundaries. Through this cult, respect of private property, neighbours, boundaries, landmarks and just about any reserve of land was promoted and soon spread throughout Roman society. An interesting side note to mention about the Temple of Janus is that its gates were kept open during times of war and closed during times of peace. During Numa's 43 year reign, the gates remained closed, a record for Rome. To put that into perspective, when the next king Tullus Hostilius went to war with Alba Longa, the gates remained open for the next 400 years. 
It's easy to see why Numa was so celebrated for his mission of peace and unity between the Sabines and the Romans, but many also celebrated him for his divine abilities to commune with the gods. His ascension to the throne at all was said to have been under the will of Jupiter, and so it isn't too much to say that Numa was favoured by the gods. However, some gods or divine figures certainly favoured him more. Take the nymph for example that I mentioned earlier that had supposedly seduced him after the death of his wife. This nymph was otherwise known as Egeria and was said to have taught him to become effective in the setting of laws. Going by what esteemed historian Titus Livius or Livy had once said about Numa and Egeria, he was said to meet with her on a nightly basis where she would serve as his own personal counsel, giving him insights both politically and socially so as to best rule his people. Plutarch however, partly disagreed and believed that Numa played on this belief that people had of him and used it to establish his own aura of divine allure, allowing him to captivate the early warring Romans. In doing so, he was able to get them to abide by laws and set aside their swords, a feat that other men ruling by sheer force may not have been successful in doing. Other legends revolving around Numa include his authoring of several sacred books, books that he'd written down his divine teachers from Egeria and the other heavenly entities. However, it's understood that at his request, he wished for the books to be buried along with his corpse at the time of his own death, so as to prevent the misinterpretation and deliberate sabotage of these writings by those who came after him. Plutarch stated that these books were recovered some four to five hundred years after Numa's burial in 181 BC, after a flood exposed his tomb. While the books were said to have been examined by the Senate, they were deemed inappropriate for disclosure and subsequently burned. Could it be they discovered some secrets of the gods that they kept for themselves? Other historians believe that the books weren't burned at all and were instead kept a very close secret amongst the priests, but all of this is just speculation. Another interesting side note is that while the books were discovered after the flood, legends say that Numa's body was mysteriously missing. In perhaps one of his most famous tales, a plague was ravaging the population, and when Numa asked the gods for guidance, a brass shield fell from the sky. Numa declared that Egeria had told him it was a gift from Jupiter, and it would be used for Rome's protection. The shield would become known as the Ancili, or the Ancili, and would be known throughout the ages as a sacred relic of the Romans. In order to prevent anyone from stealing it, Numa crafted 11 others that were identical to the original. In fact, the replicas were so indistinguishable from the original that it's said that Numa himself could not tell the difference. The 12 shields would become known as the Ancilia, or the sacred shields of Jupiter. This leads onto another of Numa's essential inductions, and this was the institution of priests, known as the Sali, who were responsible for the safety of the Ancilia. Numa also introduced priests of the god Mars, Jupiter, and even Romulus, who was now recognised as the god Quirinus, after his ascension to the heavens. Other orders of priests include the Pontifices, who were responsible for the public sacrifices and funeral ceremonies, and the Fecials, who were the peacemakers. Four Vestal Virgins were also instated, who were tasked with keeping a sacred flame alight in Rome, and who were responsible for the preparation of grains and salts used in public sacrifices. Numa's rule over Rome was progressive to say the least. He was active in the promotion of the land that had been previously conquered by Romulus and even distributed large chunks of it to the poor and the plebeians in the hopes that they would adopt agricultural lifestyles. The idea that by committing to agriculture, farming and creating, the early warlike Romans would forget about violence that they had become accustomed to and spend more of their time better in the community. Numa would actually visit the farms of these lands personally and would endorse the owners of the farms he deemed cared for and admonish those he deemed were insufficient. Naturally, this gave the farmers more incentive to produce the best that they could as praise from the king, a king who could talk to gods no less, was no small thing. Guilds were also created by Numa that were based off a citizen's profession in that it would force Romans and Sabines alike to work together through trade and business and overcome the us and them mentality that was still prevalent after Romulus' death. Much of the story surrounding Numa is pure legend, though how much of it is pure legend is hard to say. 
The idea that Rome was free from strife and war under Numa's golden rule can be quite difficult to comprehend, but this was a history that the Romans believed and upheld to the fullest. Whether Numa was a man who could commune with the gods, or a man who had an uncanny ability to mould his society to his own expectations, is up to you to decide. Let me know what you thought about Numa Pompilius, and who you'd like to see next on Roman History Explained. If you haven't already subscribed, please do so, and don't forget to hit that bell icon to receive notifications. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up, and be sure to share. Until the next time guys.